I know my friends that are big developers, and these are big developers that are in, we're talking Orange County, California, and the banks are making them put 60% down. That's wild. Think about that when you're talking about a return on capital, 30% versus 60% down. Your returns start to really get diminished when you have to put that much capital down. Yep. <laughs> you, you, you lose the benefit of Again, debt leverage. leverage yep. Yeah. It's gone. The reason being is we said there's a bubble. And when this bubble pops, markets like the Boise area, which is our backyard, the Phoenix area, Nashville, and others is going to be hit hard. One of the best ways to optimize management and to increase the value of your self-storage facility is through property management. And that means you're going to need really good property management software to extract the maximum amount of value and deploy the maximum amount of value at your storage facility. That's where Tenant Inc. comes in. These guys have a huge amount of tools at your fingertips that you guys can deploy. Again, this is Tenant Inc. Check them out. Link is in the show notes. Welcome, everybody, to Self Storage Income. And uh, Connor, we're starting the morning off today with this podcast. Dude, bright and early. Uh, my mind may or may not be working well. I've got the uh, energy drink here to assist. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see. It should be a good one, though, man. Um, what you were talking to me about uh, just before the podcast, I think, is going to be really, really good to dive into. Um, a lot of questions out there, a lot yeah. of new people in the industry. So yes. it's going to be exciting to kind of clear things up. Yeah, I, you know, it, it really spurs um, back to, well, well over a year ago now when I talked about the self storage bubble and what was happening. And at the time, you know, things were killing it, they were just on fire. And by on fire, I, uh, let me give you guys some background for those of you that don't know or haven't read or, or heard about that. I think I even have a YouTube video out on it. I mean, but the we wanted to get an update essentially. Um, but to the last, really taken out the last year, for the previous three years, we had like an average occupancy for storage of 96%. Um, historically speaking, that's crazy. You, we, we look at something more like 85 to 90 percent um so 96 percent was just out of this world and on top of that we were raising rates at you know 10 to 20 plus percent every single year just ludicrous and uh there were there were all these narratives on why why it was happening and why people were changing and and so in kind of the heat of that i put out uh, all this information showing why uh, this is not reality and it's going to end. Um, and we talked about how we were changing our investment thesis around that. And uh, that um, proved to uh, be very correct in a lot of the markets we were looking at. Street rates have been depressed by you know 30% or more. We have one market that was $2 a square foot is now a buck 20. So you know, you're talking about a 45% decline. And uh, we now see vacancies starting to rise. And I've heard a lot of people say, okay, well, it's over, right? And we're seeing occupancies decrease, rates decrease, and they're like, the party's over, right? You, you, you called it, and it, I go, first of all, hold on here. Uh, a, a bubble, right, is different than an end that obviously doesn't make sense considering how much we're building and buying and <laughs> growing our company so Still moving yep once that that bubble actually popped last year um we increased our workforce by 35 percent because now we could get all these people that their companies were laying people off and uh, i want to give an update where the industry's at it's the appropriate time so new people self-storage can be very seasonal outside tight coastal markets self-storage is booming in the summer spring summer fall winter dies so what we saw last year was the summer months were substantially slower but 
where they started to really see it was fall. And that's when occupancies and everything just tanked. First and foremost, that had not happened for like two or three years. Um, that is not normal. They should go down in the fall and winter. Now, this was different because of the, I think, the, you know, what's the word for it? Just the, it was probably, yeah, the biggest drop I've seen, right? Like it was that, that seasonal move was huge. And coming into spring, spring was much slower. And summer has been much slower. So the first thing is the bubble, which um, I, I put out information. And I'll have a YouTube so you guys can see it. But the bubble is very easily seen through the numbers now. So when you look at the average monthly cost of rent, um, the average went from the beginning of 2021 uh, 20, to 90 cents or below and once again 2020 like below that to almost a buck 20 by may or july or excuse me went up to 110 just over by july of 2020 that was up to 110 by january of 2023 that was down to a buck and going down below so that doesn't seem a lot when you're putting it in context of cents 90 cents to a buck 20. That is a square foot. When you apply that to gross revenue, that is a massive change. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking about a revenue contraction of 30%. Well, and, then values. and then values are predicated on a, 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 uh, a multiple of that revenue. So a 30% contraction in that, right? If you put a million dollars down, you bought at a you know five six cap you have a contraction of market rate revenues that go down like that your million dollars at that cap rate now has shrunk dramatically but that also doesn't take into consideration the next thing that happened and that was cap rates went up so now the property you bought at a five cap you can't sell at a five cap and the difference between a five and a seven cap to your value is huge. Uh, it sounds small, once again, five to seven. But if you, to put this in perspective, if you had a million dollar property that made $100,000, that's a 10 cap. A million dollar property at a seven, uh, or at, at that is, uh, seven cap is $70,000, right? A uh, million dollar property at a five cap is $50,000. So net income. So your net income change, that changes that million dollars. That million dollars drops. So if you have to get a seven cap on that same net income versus a five cap, your million dollars dropping radically. So that's when in real estate, they talk about leverage, but it's not just on the debt. It's also on the valuations. Now, two sides here. We're talking extrinsic value right there when we're talking about the value of properties that coincided with interest rates rising so now the cost is rising cap rates are driving up because the cost of debt is rising so if you have to refinance you bought it a five cap you have to refinance from a three percent interest rate to a seven percent and now the bank saying it's not a five cap it's a seven cap and street rates are down 20 percent you're in a world of problems right so what looks small is potentially bankruptable and this is never more true with developments and we're seeing that right now where we have talked to so many developers I, I mean it's literally probably one a week if we took four a month or more at this point that are in trouble they are going bankrupt they are not sure what they're going to do how they're going to do it um, and that is because when they started out, their underwriting was at $2 a square foot. Now it's a dollar. Well, the banks, everybody else is going, your value is off by you know huge amounts. Like it's right. not even close. So now you've got to refinance. You've got to go into a perm loan. Your cost of debt that you underwrote at 3% is now 7 Those developers are, it's a shock, right? And the banks, everybody else is saying, all right, everything that you did at first is gone. It, none of it is relevant anymore. 
your $15 million of value, air quotation, right, is 10. Mm -hmm. And so the developers are having a really hard time because of the adjustment of uh, overall, and two, by the way, uh, costs haven't decreased to development. So the input of cost hasn't changed. The revenue has changed. Well, and the, the, the banking sentiment as well, where the sentiment in, in lending, I mean, especially on developments, is totally different than it was in that same time frame just a couple of years ago. Banks or don't want developments. Rubber stamping, you know. Um, totally different environment now. Totally different. And Connor brings up a really good point. I mean, we, I know... Um, I know my friends that are big developers, and these are big developers that are in, we're talking Orange County, California, and the banks are making them put 60% down. That's wild. So think about that when you're talking about a return on capital, 30% versus 60% down your returns start to really get diminished when you have to put that much capital down. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you lose the benefit of Again, debt leverage. leverage yep. Yeah. It's gone. So now they're either saying no, but even in amazing locations that are very stable, that have high, high barriers of entry, and revenues too have been stable. So revenues in Orange County have not had huge drops like other places. Why? Because the, I often say, worst thing about investing in California is the best thing about investing in California. And that means barriers of entry are so high. That keeps stabilized rates. That's why REITs, that's why the big boys go there because they're essentially buying monopolies. Uh, to get something out of the ground is so difficult um, that you just can't flood the market with inventory. That creates more stabilized uh, rates and occupancies levels through different economic cycles. So when they're having those problems in markets like that, you can now see what's happening in second tier markets, in third tier markets, especially those growth markets. So you're talking the Boise, the Phoenix, the Nashville, the, you know, these growth markets. And when you look, we'd moved out of those growth markets roughly three years ago. The reason being is we said there's a bubble. And when this bubble pops, markets like the Boise area, which is our backyard, the Phoenix area, and uh, Nashville and others is going to be hit hard. Our response was then, we're going to work and put something out of the ground um, during the pain or after the pain. The reason being is the, the, uh, the underlying strategy is that the contraction development now helps that market massively. So three years out now, those people in those markets can't get developments out of the ground. You're constraining inventory. So those markets are actually better off after that pain. Whereas three years ago, I call it rate runway for everybody that knows. We were looking at the rate runway was negative. Like it was backwards. I'm like, there's all downside here with no upside. So we didn't want to buy. I'm not, I didn't want to buy at a five cap where revenues I thought had more chance of decreasing 15% than they did going up 15 percent so we moved into markets that had very little or no impact of new inventory that we thought had longer rate runways meaning that the price on rents couldn't support new building so they had to go up um, and that was our philosophy over the last three years and this rate bubble now and everything that has popped um, we're now trying to actively move in back into um, those areas. So right now we're sitting at average occupancies. When we're looking at January 2023, average occupancies, you know, we're down into the 82%. To give you any idea, January the year prior, um, we're like above 85%, almost to 90% in the slow months. So that retreat has been big and has had a lot of people um, get really hurt. The next thing is we've had a pretty substantial uh, substantial jumps in move outs. And I believe that our move in to move out rate, which dropped below one, meaning that if you have uh, move ins, more move ins than move outs, that makes your occupancy go up and down. Thinking of one as more of this tangible thing where if it drops below 
or if it goes more than that, you're in trouble because you have more move outs than you have move ins. So that one marker is pretty big because when it goes below that, you have so many move ins without move outs, right? As that goes up, your move outs are moving up. So the amount of moving up and moving in. That is, that is jumping right now. So we're seeing a big jump in the move out to move in ratio. All right. So now everybody's saying, okay, AJ, you have this podcast called Self-Storage Income. You're trying to help people get into storage. And you just told me that self-storage world has collapsed. It's dead. It's over. I've said none of those things. Yeah, yeah. So don't get confused. <laughs> don't get confused here. <laughs> despite the fact that after publishing my findings – which we had, I don't know, some crazy, over 700,000 people read. I started consulting with uh, major multi-billion dollar banks who made a lot of money shorting the public REITs when I told them uh, this. And after those interviews in spring of uh, whatever last year, the public REITs dropped substantially off the new numbers. Area. So then, all right, what does this mean now? And what does this mean going forward? Now, the first thing is the bubble bursting is not the industry bursting, everybody. The bubble bursting was the bubble. It was overinflated. It was overdone. It popped. And it's not going back. We are returning back to a normal. Let me put this into perspective. For the first 10 years of us in storage, we had never seen an average occupancy of 87 percent national national wide that just didn't exist right um we were buying properties where markets were 80 percent occupied for a five six year period rate increases we were shooting for three to five percent there was we never had an opportunity to give 10 plus percent right that was crazy outside an adjustment of inefficiencies in an asset standardized stabilized markets didn't see those kind of rate increases um what happened was the pent-up demand from after the great financial crisis so before the great financial crisis um we started to see storage soften after it we saw it really kind of go in a rut but that that cratered development for years so now supply was very constrained and the housing market was constrained when the housing market came back storage came back why this is happening now is not is due to the housing market. So the self-storage bubble popped, and this was the data that we showed. It wasn't a feeling. I want to make sure that's very clear. We're not like I don't we're not predicting markets. So first, I should have said this right at the first, everybody. We are not predicting markets, okay? We are looking at the inputs or the drivers of revenue and occupancy and in which areas those are changing for the good or bad. Right. And then we look at the reality of what's happening and we play that out on how far rates can go due to inventory, due to cost, because there's a balancing. Once a market goes over a certain balance, right, you have a constrained uh, supply. That means demand goes up and prices go. Once it goes to the other side, you have too much supply to the demand and prices and occupancies go down. Okay. When we looked at the drivers of demand, the reason why the bubble had been built up was because interest rates were at 2%, and everybody was moving. They were selling homes. They were refining. They were buying. And then you had COVID, which made people so they couldn't go into work, and then people started doing outdoor activities. They started remodeling homes. So the idea that the bubble would continue was predicated, first and foremost, on the COVID-like scenarios, $3 trillion, interest rates at 2%, and the economy not being open. None of those things we, like, those things weren't going to, it's not even that we knew, it's not that we were guessing, like, it's, they weren't going to continue. If they continued, we, the country would be over. You can't keep printing $3 trillion, having interest rates at 2% and not letting people go back to work and live normally, right? So if that was to continue, um, yeah, it would be over, which it was obvious that was never going to happen or continue. But the market was acting like it was. And what scared me and why I put this information out, because I was talking about this on stage and I had people that were like, 
what are you talking about? That's not what's happening. What's happening is more people like storage than they did before. And what I realized was they don't know what's going on. So what we've had, and it shows this in the numbers, you can see a transfer of owners. Roughly 60 to 80% of all private equity companies in storage started in the last four years. They, all these newcomers dominated the market in industry. And it was predicated on short-term things. And then two, they started looking really good in their numbers. Why? Because they bought four years prior, cap rates went from seven to five, <laughs> and we were rising rates at 15%. I mean this when I say, if you had a pulse, you won in self-storage. Mm. Like You had to actively try to get people not to move in. We did that. We actively tried. How? We were jacking up rates to kick people out. It was the only environment I've ever seen where we had to try as hard as we could to get people out. And where the whole future of storage was the opposite. Our whole full focus was not on getting people out. It was on getting people in. So it, 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 speaking, in, if you were in storage at all over the last 20 years, you knew this is ludicrous. It's not working. But the vast majority of players had only come since 2016. Since 2016, when banks wanted to be in storage, when all of a sudden investors wanted to be, private equity wanted, third-party management came out, syndications came out. Since 2016, they had never had a, we had one year where it softened, but every year cap rates went down, occupancies went up, and rates went up. Every single year. And they went up massively. We're not even talking about a little here. So all these new people that had come into it were just, they were- amazing assets. Yeah, it was <laughs> mind blowing. So then what did that cause? Even more people started to get in. Wall Street Journal, everybody started publishing articles about storage, 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 right? And when we saw this, we're like, we're in a bubble, right? Like same thing that happened in housing. In housing from 2005, and four, really, 2000 to seven, you had all these people that had never been real estate investors jump into the market. Home prices just kept going up, and there was a narrative that they couldn't fail. All those same things happened to storage. They called it recession-proof. I saw an article literally like a month ago that called it recession-proof. And I was just like, what are you talking about? You obviously don't understand this asset class or no. Um, two, by the way, a huge portion of my base of assets we purchased from developers that were going bankrupt and, and short selling. So um, there was this crazy. Now, that's not trying to take away what storage is or not. Obviously, everyone, I am full into this. Like we, When I say full into this, I have seven companies right now that only do storage. They are either market participants through software, architecture, there are private equity side, there are baseline and assets, which I don't sell. We're not short-term players. We're holding our assets. We're creating long-term wealth based upon fundamentals. So once again, everybody, I'm not bashing on the industry or anything else, but we're trying to give it a dose of reality. And that's really important because what happened is the people that were suffering were only suffering because they made bad decisions. The people that are losing their facilities, they're people that are um, having to recapitalize, that are doing all of these things. Guys, those were all should have been avoided. Mm -hmm. They should have been avoided, right? And that's what's frustrating to me is that the pain that we see and we talk to people daily on this stuff, when we're talking to banks now, we're having a hard time getting loans because somebody else made a really bad decision in storage. I was just gonna say that that full circle effect when you have so many people, like you're always talking about the rising tide lifting all ships, right? Yes. We had this influx of all these new individuals, private equity firms, all of that into an industry. And absolutely, it's gonna have that, that full circle effect on um, individuals' ability to go out there and secure lending on storage, for sure. Now, and to everybody, I'm not bashing on new people. But I have, I have two missions. 
Let's say poor owners and operators. Poor owners and operators, exactly. I think when we talk about the new people and the influx, what we're talking about is I'm talking mainly about big money. Because the big money came in and was raising hundreds of millions and deploying it at five caps at any cost whatsoever just to get their money into the industry, jacking up rates across the country, or, or excuse me, um, um, dropping, yeah, jacking up values, dropping cap rates, and uh, were more money managers than they were. These weren't storage people. Yeah. They were capital allocators that then pretended to be storage people. And that is very different from us. We only started taking capital after we'd already built our storage companies. So when we saw that, it was eye-opening. And it was like, these people are going to be in trouble. Because previously, guys, the industry had only storage owners and operators. There was no third-party management. There was So those people that were in the game, they were building. They had to actually operate. They had to sell those units. They were building correctly. They were building for the long term. They took great structures on their debt. They took really they had really good contracts with investors and that is the reason why this is the best performing asset in 23 years that is the reason why it's the lowest defaulting asset in 26 years and, and best performing in 26 years the reason is is because the people that were in it prior they didn't lose their shorts during 2008 because they had low debt they had fundamentals they built right and they could live through that storm their revenues dropped. So 2008 happening today, the self-storage industry would be decimated. Decimated. It would not be the same thing. Look where it's at even now with yeah. a, uh, a slight adjustment. A slight adjustment. <laughs> and it's like, and, and I tell people and I tell our investors, we are long-term, we have long-term set interest rate locks. We have long-term base plays. Because in the short term, we don't know what's going to happen. And our assets and us, we survive in uh, uh, short term fluctuations. The problem is things were good for so long. And so many people that were in it had never seen anything but not even good. Crazy. Um, and that created unrealistic expectations upon assets. That created unrealistic expectations on timing. So when we're looking at our models, I call it money on the table, everybody. We are looking to what we can extract to get to a valuation point that is not predicated on cap rates or external things, internal changes. That takes time. So we have to, we have to change those assets operationally, physically. We are implementing long-term rate revenue guidance strategy. We do that at the expense of the short term because that's how you should. And I'm a huge firm believer in that, unless you're a flipper. And then if you are, that's fine. You need to call it, though, what it is, right? You're not an owner-operator. You are a market participant, and you're flipping. I have no problem with it at all. But to say that one thing's the other, that's where we start to get really, really screwy. Now, when you look at this bubble pop, let's, uh, you know, and once again, too, by the way, I'm not, I'm not, doing this to get anybody to not invest if if nobody wanted to get into self-storage my business model's over so that would be very bad for me okay but like you said i think you put it really well man is it, it's just uh and i think it's something that a lot of people need to hear especially other owners operators um private equity firms developers uh it, it is just a dose of reality and a dose yeah. of truth and and that's okay to, to bury our heads in the sand and and pretend yes. that it's not going on or <clears> to call it something else um, it's not going to help anybody so 100 percent. and we're returning to a normal and that is good so for all of those people that are um saying okay what's the future look like what's going to happen um let me put this into perspective some of our assumptions some may be right some may be wrong but the assumption that we fully believe is just and we don't think is wrong at all we're returning to an equilibrium of normalcy Storage was not normal for the last five years. It's returning back to normal. That means seasonality, and that means you have to focus on getting customers. So it's back to business basics. It's back to what it should have been and has always been. And none of that is bad. None of those things are bad. So when we look at that, that means sustained market cycles of 90 plus percent occupancies 
is ridiculous. You shouldn't plan on it. That's That would be bad. That would be bad for the asset, everybody. Um, and I know people that hear that said, no, that wouldn't. That wouldn't be bad. Yes, it would. Because what would happen then is the expectations of development and new supply would be so crazy that we would destroy our own market. Because there would literally you're making it so it's like there's no chance you could even lose and then you get bad players which is what we had happen over the last two three years so we're seeing now the drivers that's affecting storage okay so what you guys need to understand the main driver that's affecting storage today is what we stated in um and two uh, i need to put this on the website everybody so i will i'll just take my thread and my paper and put it on the website um so uh, George will do that. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, but we, um, the the interest rates rising. So we were having inflation, interest rates were rising. Transitory inflation for everybody that's listening to my podcast knows how much I just railed on that. That was a made up word at the time to try to justify things. But interest rates as they rose, what was the number one asset class that interest rates would affect? For us, homes. Because that is the most sensitive sector to interest rates. Now, we in no way, shape, or form thought that the housing bubble was going to burst. Why? Because we had data, which you can see in the thread, showed that it was something crazy, like 95% of everybody had 35-year mortgages at under 4% interest rates. And interest and incomes were rising. So inflation, that actually puts them in a better position. Their income's rising, but their main bill is fixed. So equity wasn't leaving. Payability wasn't leaving. Um, uh, payability? Affordability. Speaking of making up <laughs> terms and words, uh, roll so, with it. Roll with relevant. it. Own That's it. right. Own it. I'm going to just go with that. Uh, pull a, uh, government. Um, so when we uh, uh, when we look at that situation, the main driver, which is over 45 percent of all our customers, come into us because of that in, right there, housing. So the main driver, we're like that hose is going to be shut off. And two, even worse than 2008, we believed. Now you could say, well, how is it worse? Now to the degree to which I don't think is actually nearly as bad as we were expecting, and I'll, and I'll talk about that. The reason why it was worse than 2008, which people listening to this go, there's no way, AJ, because 2008 home values lost all the spring. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't care about the home values. I don't care about that. What I'm talking about is the opposite of 2008. Homes don't lose their values, meaning that people don't move. Yeah, no, there's, one's moving no one's moving anywhere. They're stuck. So all of a sudden you have an entire market which is frozen, values are up, payability, people are happy, they're not losing their homes, all that's great, we're very happy about that. But what it means is transactions stop. That's what happened in the fall. The transactions of housing just froze, came to a standstill. That is far worse for us than anything else because when people are losing or downsizing their homes, they move. But that market being frozen caused the huge drop in the fall of occupancies and rates because it hit us so hard. Now, that um, market is actually, we believe, is thawing out. And that showed in the, our spring rebound was good. It wasn't anything like a normal cycle should have been. It was far less. But what we found is that our rebound in the spring didn't go to any of the historical or the last two years. We didn't return to that. The next downturn in the fall, we will be, uh, believe will be not nearly as bad as last fall, but it'll still be significant. So we've kind of hit a new high. The next low that we hit on occupancy and rates, <clears throat> we believe is the base. Why? Because with housing, what we found is the housing market is so tight that people are still having to transact, although at very way, way lower volumes. What that means then is in markets that were oversupplied, they got hammered. In markets that were predicated on massive growth, they got hammered because their growth rates slowed. So you're getting killed on that. But other markets, right, that weren't predicated on huge growth, that it's, it's just not as good. So rates are coming down, occupancies are coming down, but we're returning to a new normal. All of this is good, everybody. All of this is good. We're, we're, I'm very bullish. I'm extraordinarily excited. And I think a lot of people that jumped in are jumping out. I also love that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, for all <laughs> of you that want to get right in and want to be long-term players and are serious, which are all the people that are listening to this podcast, 
you know, religiously. They're not just looking for a quick fix. They're not looking for a quick market in. You all are going to do great. In fact, you all are going to do better because I don't know if you were around for the last two years previous to last fall trying to buy things at a five cap. You're competing with big money people that don't care, don't understand. We're now in a more competitive. Where What hurts in self storage is transaction volume. That, that faucet just died. The amount of storage facility owners that were selling dropped, but also they were totally unrealistic. So for all of you that are trying to acquire, whew, man, I, I, I feel you. Like, <laughs> like I, I'm right here with you guys. It sucks. We're just not seeing deals. And the deals that we're seeing, we have a 30% spread in the bid and ask. Um, the reason being is they want to be paid like they used to for the last three, four years. And people are like, we can't pay you that. Interest rates doubled. So um, that means that what I would call sell opportunistic sellers are gone. The last two years we had, or three years, we had a lot of opportunistic sellers, meaning that I don't want to sell, but you're going to pay me so much I will. Mm -hmm. A totally different kind of seller. Those people are gone. We're now moving back into normal seller markets, which the transaction volume of the last three years from sellers was double that of anything normal in the highs of the years previous to that. So now we're returning. What that means, everybody, not only do you have to fight to get customers, you actually have to do something and really work to get assets. Once again, that's fine. That's normal. good. That's normal, people. <laughs> so the bubble has burst, and now we're returning back to a normal. The baseline in occupancy and rents, we fully believe, will be next January. Outliers. Massive contraction in the economy, which we think that we are, um, we, are it, we do not believe is going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean we think it's going to be good. In fact, it's the opposite. We believe that things are just going to be sluggish and not good for a long period of time. So you have two types of contractions, quick ones that are violent and long ones that suck. They're not violent, but they just don't stop. And we're in that. So last year's not fun. Um, this year's not fun. We believe, and I wrote about this all, and it still stands true. We believe that 2024 is really going to start to be a turnaround but 2005, we believe things are going to start picking up and being good again. Now, that means the window of opportunity is, that seems long, but as far as your investing path and career, it's not. It's very short. We're talking about a year and a half here. So work, everybody. Get out there and make it happen. Get the deals while you can. We are getting better deals than we've gotten over the last three years. The problem just not a lot of them. That's why we have our opportunistic fund, which is open right now. You guys can check it out. But we're buying opportunistic properties that we couldn't get in other market cycles. Mm -hmm. And that is, we've done, this is exactly what we did in 2008 on. That turnaround for us was wealth creation like we couldn't have imagined. And that's what we're doing again. Opportunistic assets that, I mean, guys, we got, we have an asset in our fund that we just closed that is 80 5,000 square feet in a city of a population of 2 million that we have owner financing on non-recourse, 5% first year, 4% second, 3% 3, 3 um, third year, and locked in from there. 30% under market rates. Mom and pop to the extreme. Large asset, dense population. That did not exist for the last three years. So we're finding these deals, expansion opportunities and markets that are locked up, right? And in ways that we never had. All of those are good things. Self-storage isn't over, it's recorrecting, be smart. Do not expect 90 plus percent occupancies, rates going up 10% when you're underwriting. Be smart. And with that, you will have probably the greatest opportunity that we will see in the next 10 years. And from someone that's been through these cycles, trust me, that is big, that is amazing, that is life changing. Hence the reason why we've opened up our opportunistic fund, why we're trying to capture all of that. And we believe that this year is gonna be really big. 
um, where I actually think everybody, our plan is transactions during the fall and the winter. We believe fall will pick up where they're dead now. Uh, the reason being is owners are trying to capture the busy season to get higher rates, higher occupancies, so they can sell at a higher valuation. And I think when that doesn't play out nearly as good as they wanted, then they have to just, all right, I have to sell. I need to sell. I was a real seller, but I was trying to hold off. So that's why spring and summer were so low on transactions. We believe fall, it's going to pick up, and we want to be capturing those sellers that are real. And then next year, um, winter will probably still be a little the same. And then we expect the next fall again to be a, a, a good acquisition time. So <clears throat> next two years, we're going hard, really, really hard. We've increased my payroll dramatically. I've increased the size of my companies. We've started more companies right when the bubble's popping. Now, people may say, oh, that's bad timing. It's because of the timing. That was during the fall when it was popping that we were doing this because we take advantage of it when it's down. We did the same thing prior. We essentially stopped buying in 2005. And then by 2000 uh, or 2005, right? Yeah, 2005, six, that was kind of our last year. And then 2010, we ramped up in a way that we'd never previously done. Um, and then we slowed down. Then we had that big bump stuff and we slowed down dramatically in our acquisitions and everything else. So uh, this is the time everybody Take advantage of it. The self-storage bubble has popped, and that is the best thing for both you and us. It really is. And, uh, you know, all this stuff, it's uh, simple, but it's not easy. And um, with that said, we talked about a lot of things here on the podcast. Another thing that uh, we do in-house are the feasibility studies. So if you're listening right. to this and you're like, man, is it I need good? Is help, it bad? We're here for you. Check it out on the website. And banks require those, everybody. Yep. So, <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Thanks, awesome. everybody, for listening. We'll Thanks, catch you guys. next time. Talk soon.